today we're going to be talking about intro to backpacking um, and backpacking can be super intimidating if you have never done it. Um, you know, there's all this gear uh, that's expensive or can be expensive and you have to pack it a certain way and then you have to carry it right and it's heavy so um, I want to break it down a little bit and break it into some different systems uh, to make it a little bit easier uh, and more inviting so um, let's see if I can figure out how to work the PowerPoint um, so the first thing to consider is how are you getting into the backcountry so you know technically this is a backpacking course but there are some different ways to get um, into the backcountry with your backpack. So, um, you know, some trail crews might car camp and then backpack in each day um, and probably can pack more stuff than somebody who's carrying everything on their back. Um, with backpacking, you know, you're carrying all of your gear, your tools, your food on your back in your backpack. Um, Sometimes crews have the honor of being uh, horse packed into the back country. And so they might just carry some of their uh, personal gear and then the mules and horses will carry tools and food and um, other equipment for the crews. Uh, and then there are trail crews or wilderness rangers that'll get dropped in the back country by a plane. Um, or boat it in, and then they'll backpack around with their gear. So just want people to keep these in mind because each of these kind of have their own restrictions. Um, we're not going to dive too deep, but, you know, if you are headed out um, and you have a horse packer, talk to the horse packer, see what they're comfortable taking in for you. You know, don't bring your blow up sofa and, you know, all the random things that you want to make a super comfy camp in the backcountry. Check in with them, see what they're comfortable carrying in, um, and go from there. Uh, same with, you know, an airplane drop. Double check if there's any weight restrictions, that sort of stuff, um, before you get going. Uh, but today we'll be talking about just carrying everything on your back the whole time. Um, so some things to consider uh, before we even think about packing our backpack are um, the weight that we're able to carry, you know, what's our physical fitness level? Um, you know, are we able to carry these loads for long distances? Um, and beyond our personal items, you know, do we have to carry tools as well? Um, and then, you know, how bulky is your gear? You know, you might have a zero degree sleeping bag that is gonna keep you warm, but if it, certain ones might fill up your entire backpack and then you don't have room for anything else. So, um, you know, looking for things that are less bulky. Um, what material is your equipment made out of? Um, you know, wool is really great, synthetics. Um, you don't want, cotton right cotton gets damp and then it doesn't dry and then especially in the southeast it's really gross um you get really sweaty you're sweaty the whole week <laughs> um yeah and then you know material as well you're looking at your sleeping bag you know is it a down bag is it a synthetic bag down bags are really good in dry environments and they have um, new technologies that allow down to work better in uh, wetter environments like the southeast, but um, synthetics are also a great option uh, there. And then you also want to consider your trip length, right? Because with trip length, you're going to need more food, you might need more articles of clothing, and that's going to take up more room in your pack. Uh, you also want to consider what season, right? If it's winter time, I'm going to want to carry more layers and probably more food um, than I would in the summertime to make sure that I'm able to keep myself warm. Uh, and then you want to think about the climate, right? Is it going to be raining? Is it going to be dry? Um, you know, 
what's the, yeah, what's the weather going to be like? Um, you know, when I worked out West, you know, I could get away with having a rain jacket and maybe a pack cover, but in the East, I want to have a tarp to be able to cook under because the rain, you know, just keeps coming. So. Maybe this uh, is a good, good place to jump and ask you a quick question. I was asked right out of the gate is, yep. do you have a particular definition of backcountry? Because it, that probably rolls into all these things you're talking about in terms of what to consider taking. Yeah. Is any, is any trip beyond the trailhead a backcountry experience? I do think any trip beyond the trailhead, you know, is a backcountry experience. And you might not even think that you're going backpacking, but it's good to have at least some of these things with you on a day hike um, in case you end up having to spend the night out there. But I think if you're a mile from the road and you carry all of your stuff in, all of this um, applies. But, you know, the depending on um ability level and distance you know you want to consider whether or not you can carry a certain amount of weight you know for longer distances um and you may need to adjust what's in your pack um accordingly thank you yep any other questions right now or no we're good Um, so, like I mentioned earlier, uh, for this presentation, I kind of broke it into different systems, right? So, when I'm packing, I'm thinking about my sleep system and my kitchen system and my hygiene system and my clothing system. And I'm going to break all of these down. But these eight bubbles are kind of the different um, systems that I came up with. Um, for this presentation. There may be other ones. Um, and, and also what I'm sharing with you is my personal experience and, you know, professional knowledge, but there are different ways of packing. There's different um, thought processes on the appropriate materials and everything else. So um, take this information and build on it, you know, and pull stuff out that you like, leave stuff that you don't like, talk to other people. Um, but these backpacking systems, um, I think we'll start with um, your sleep system, right? So if we're out in the backcountry, a good night's sleep is so important, especially if you're hiking long days, you're swinging a tool all day, um, you wanna be able to get into your tent and lay down on that um, sleeping pad and go to sleep. And so figuring out what works for you is gonna be really important here. Um, I personally, this is my one, uh, one person tent in the photo. I use an inflatable sleeping pad. Um, in this photo, I had a zero degree sleeping bag, um, down sleeping bag, uh, and I think I used a sweatshirt or like a fleece as a pillow. Um, that's what works for me. Other people um, probably have a completely different system, but when you are um, looking for a sleeping bag, uh, you wanna look at the temperature rating uh, and think about your own personal experience. I am a cold person and so, it might say that it's only gonna get down to 30 degrees it, but I'm gonna bring my zero degree bag because I know that I'll get cold in the night. And so um, being aware of that, so the temperature rating, um, you, want, you might wanna think about the weight of the sleeping bag, depending on how much room you have in your pack and um, how much space you need for other things. Um, and then also think about maybe what material is going to work best in the climate um, or season that you're in. Um, but, you know, there's also the cost factor, right? And um, so you likely will find sleeping bags that are a little bit bulkier, um, that are a lot cheaper. And you can work with that. You know, your pack might be a little bit bigger. You might have a couple things hanging off the back of your pack, but um, 
it, it's still functional. So um, I don't think you have to have the lightest, nicest sleeping bag to get out there. Um, and then for a sleeping pad, um, there's a few different options. A sleeping pad is really great because it helps insulate you from the ground. Um, you don't have to have it, but uh, it's definitely a comfortable um, addition to your sleeping system. Um, a closed cell foam sleeping pad is just a, a foam sleeping pad that kind of, it's the ones that roll up or um, kind of close like an accordion. Um, and those are affordable um, or more affordable than the inflatable ones usually um, and work really well. Um, there's also some great inflatable ones. There's, uh, and that kind of gives you just a little bit more cushion, um, but depending on the sleeping pad, there may not be as much insulation between you and the ground with those inflatable sleeping pads. So keeping that in mind with, um, you know, what type of temperatures you're gonna experience. Um, and then choosing a tent, uh, you want to think about, you know, how many people are going to be sleeping in the tent, um, and how much room do you need? Do you need to be able to store your gear in the tent? Um, so I can get away with a one person tent. Um, but if I'm out on like a nine day hitch, I honestly like having a two person tent because then I can keep my backpack in there. I can keep all of my clothes organized and um, just kind of have a little bit more room uh, and give myself some personal space. Um, you want to look at weight, right? Because everything we put in our backpack, we're carrying ourselves. Um, and then a tent usually comes with a footprint, which is basically a ground tarp or ground cloth. Um, and then a tent body, which is the mesh section that you know, is the main structure. Um, and then a rain fly, um, which is your rain protection, right? And then there's um, stakes and poles in there. And different tents are set up differently, right? But those are kind of the basic pieces of a tent. Um, and I highly recommend bringing all the pieces with you. You know, you could opt to not have a rain fly, or you could opt to not carry the tent body and just use the rain fly. But um, I've definitely run into situations where it has rained a lot more than I expected it to, or there's way more bugs than I thought there would be. And I, I personally really like to carry my entire tent uh, with me at this point in my life. Um, and then, you know, also be aware of what other shelter options are out there, right? So some people, just sleep under tarps and that works awesome. Um, you know, you maybe don't have the bug protection. Um, and then some people sleep in hammocks, so you don't need like the tent body, um, but it, and I don't know as much about um, hammock systems, but, you know, do your research because everybody's gonna be comfortable um, or have a different level of comfort, right? So, um, yeah, take a look at some different options. And then, you know, if you're lucky, you might end up um, with a backcountry cabin. And then at that point, you probably don't need to bring a tent or um, maybe even a sleeping pad, but uh, obviously figure that out before you head into the backcountry. A um, couple options on the sleep systems. Um, or additional options are a sleeping bag liner, which can increase the temperature rating of your sleeping bag. Um, so say I have a 20 degree sleeping bag, um, but I feel like I'm gonna be cold, I can get a sleeping bag liner and that's gonna improve um, the temperature rating on my sleeping bag um, to make me more comfortable. And then, you know, they make like little blow up pillows and stuff you're welcome to carry one of those. I usually just take a fleece and stuff it into like a stuff sack and sleep on that and it works fine. So. Hey, Katie, while we're on uh, still on sleep time, there's a question about using, you know, this backcountry quilts. Have you ever had an experience or anybody listening? And if you want to throw in the chat box, if you've used quilts instead of uh, actual sleeping bags, I'm uh, just curious if anybody's got any thoughts on that. 
Yeah, I have used a quilt before and um, some of them are nice because on the bottom they have like a closure so you can almost kind of create like a foot box in the quilt. Um, and yeah, it, it was totally fine. Um, I would just say test it out before you take it on, you know, a seven or eight day trip um, just to make sure that you're comfortable with it. I would say that applies to uh, hammocks too. If you've never hammock camped, you ought to try it in the front country before you're on an eight day hits and finding out that you can't get a good night's sleep. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, like take all this gear and set it up in your backyard or at a local park or in your living room even, um, you know, and test it out and even sleep in it for a night just to see, um, you know, if you're warm enough, uh, you know, if you have the right sleeping pad, that sort of stuff. Um, yeah. And then next we're going to talk about kind of the clothing system. Um, and I, I'm not going to go too far into this. I do have a full packing list, um, at the end of the presentation, but, uh, some things to consider when, you know, deciding what clothing you're going to bring with you, you know, what season is it? What climate, what kind of weather are you going to run into? What are your personal preferences? And then I didn't list this one, but, you know, what, um, what type of work are you going to be doing? Are you just doing a recreational backpacking trip or are you doing a work backpack trip? You know, because a trail crew, they're going to need work pants, work boots, you know, probably a uniform shirt. Um, and then they'll need clothes to change into after, um, the work day. Um, so we'll get to the list of all the different, um, clothing pieces that I recommend. Um, but I think layering is an excellent option in the back country because then rather than just taking a t-shirt and like a really heavy duty puffy jacket, if you take a t-shirt a midweight and like a light puffy, then you have multiple options that you can wear them all or wear two of them um, and, you know, really fine tune it um, for your personal comfort. So, and I guess the other thing in this photo, this is my friend, Teresa, um, we were in Utah backpacking and it was, it was a cold trip, but um, your sleeping bag is a great additional layer of warmth. I don't, this was our last morning. So she took her sleeping bag out of the tent. I don't recommend just like having your sleeping bag out and about in camp, right? Because you, you want it to stay dry. You want it to stay clean. But if you are super cold and you have all your layers on, eat your dinner and then get in your sleeping bag and do some crunches or something and warm yourself up. But that sleeping bag is just a whole nother layer of insulation, so. So Katie, a couple of comments. Um, one is somebody added the benefit of bag liners is it keeps the inside of your bag clean, uh, less you have to wash it less frequently, uh, particularly if you're on an eight, nine day hitch where you're working, uh, you don't wanna bring all that grime into your bag. Uh, but then also the question is, once somebody wants to know how you should wash a down sleeping bag. Mm. <laughs> well, <laughs> Uh, I probably don't do it properly. I, you know, all sleeping bags should be washed um, in machines that don't have one of those agitators in the center. Those agitators can rip your bag. So you want like a front loading washer or um, a lot of the newer top loading washers don't have those agitators anymore. Um, and then you can go to uh, like REI or any other outdoor store and they usually have like a specific type of um, detergent that you're supposed to use on sleeping bags. Um, and then once you wash it with a down sleeping bag, you should dry it, I think on low in a large dryer with tennis balls to kind of get it to refluff. So, but, um, yeah, there should be directions on the sleeping bag too. Um, so, you know, I'd, I'd follow whatever they tell you to do. 
There's also a question about, do you recommend a foam roller or a yoga mat as part of the kit? Mm. You know, um, depending on the situation, maybe. Yeah. I mean, if, if you're getting, I personally wouldn't want to backpack in with a foam roller, but if you have the space and it's an important part of you feeling healthy and comfortable in the back country, um, yeah, by all means bring it. Or, you know, if you're with a bigger crew and that's one of those items that everybody wants, um, you know, you can kind of space out all that group gear, including, you know, a roller um, between people. And yeah, I think I probably could have used that a few times on trail crew, but <laughs> great. And then the next system is the kitchen system. Um, and so, you know, packing uh, stove and fuel so that you can cook your meals, right? There's a variety of different stoves. Um, some are much better at just boiling water. So whatever food you, um, decide to have should, um, really just need like rehydrating. And then there's also stoves that work better for cooking full meals, right? So, um, these are just examples, but like, pocket rockets or jet boils are great for boiling water. Um, and you can cook on them, but it's, you know, they're really high heat. Um, but then like dragonfly and whisper lights by MSR, they're a little bit easier to cook larger meals on. Um, and it's really important to figure out what type of fuel, um, your stove takes different stoves take different fuels or different types of canisters. So figure that out and make sure that you've got enough and don't rely on borrowing from someone else in your group because they might have a different um, type of fuel. Uh, and somebody might ask in the chat, you know, how much fuel should I bring out? Um, that depends, right? It depends on how much you plan on cooking. Do you plan on cooking breakfast and dinner or um, so I would recommend um, bringing more than you think you need for the first hitch or your first backpacking trip. And, you know, at the end of the trip, look at how much you cooked and how much fuel you have left. And then you can start to gauge that for yourself. Um, and then it's great to bring out, you know, pots and pans, um, you know, small um, Backpacking pots are sold at different outdoor stores. You also can go to Goodwill and pick up like a small, um, like just a small pot and, you know, it might pack a little weird, but it'll be totally functional. Um, utensils, um, you know, forks, sporks, uh, a pocket knife, just so that you have something to eat out of or eat with. Um, you can also, you know, if you lose your spork in the middle of a trip, you can take a couple sticks and make yourself some chopsticks um, to eat with. Uh, and then you want some sort of, uh, well, it's nice to have some sort of like dish to eat out of, right? So I, I take out a Tupperware because that way, if I have extra food, I have a way to store it um, for lunch the next day. Uh, but, you know, you could just bring a bowl or a plate, um, kind of whatever you prefer to eat out of. Um, and then at least for my trail crews, they really like having tarps um, to cook under because at least in the Southeast, very rainy. Um, and so it creates kind of a nice hangout area um, and dry place to make dinner um, after a long day. Um, and then the next system is the food system, right? And Carol's going to go into this. Um, so I'm not going to spend time on, you know, how many calories you should be getting or that sort of stuff. But um, you want to make sure that you have enough food in the back country. And, but you also have to balance that with, you only have so much space, right? Because 
um, your backpack is maybe only 65 liters, 70 liters, um, and you have all your other gear in there. So looking at food that's calorie dense um, and pretty compact or as compact as possible. Um, so dehydrated um, or dried, you know, items are awesome. And you also want to think about um, how much preparation the food's going to take and how much preparation you're willing to do. Um, you know, in the backcountry, it can be um, really nice to have a gourmet meal, but it's also really nice to get back to camp and be able to boil some water and pour it over, you know, a dehydrated meal and be able to eat immediately. So, um, Carol dive into, you know, how to plan for food. Um, but yeah, just keep in mind that, um, you're going to need more food than you usually do in the front country. Um, because you're, you're going to be expending more energy. Uh, the next system is food storage. Um, so that Katie, goes back. Katie, before yep. you get into food storage in your kitchen kit, like thinking about in a gear, a cruise situation, situation, like how much bleach, for example, for doing dishes, if you're in a group setting where you want to rinse dishes is, and, and are, do you have any tricks on, um, transporting the bleach in a safe, you know, safe way and that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, what Bill is talking about is with our trail crews, we would send them out with, um, bat like dish bags that, uh, hold water so that they could do dishes each night after they cooked. And so we'd have a bag of water for, uh, soap, a bag of water for a rinse, and a bag of water for a cold bleach uh, to finish sanitizing it all. And so um, I would send the crews out with, Nalgene makes, I want to say it's probably an eight ounce um, little container. Um, and I would write bleach all over it, but then we would send them out with that. Uh, Clorox has also started to make bleach pellets which are dried bleach and so you just take a scoop and put it into um the water bag you know and that is an excellent option because then you aren't worried about spilling bleach all over your things um so yeah well i'll get to um i have a hygiene slide and that's part of that but you know right, just um it is important to clean all your stuff, um, especially if you're cooking in a group setting, uh, because, I mean, we're still in a pandemic and um, yeah, so we need to just be aware of making sure that we're not spreading things across camp. Um, and so doing dishes and, you know, following proper hygiene protocols are crucial for that. So, so Katie, I just want to remind everybody, good job in using the chat. There's a lot of little hints and things going in there to share with others. So please keep doing that. That's really, it's cool. really helpful. Thanks. Awesome. Um, yeah. So uh, the next system is our uh, food storage system, right? So we bring all this food into the back country, but then we need to put it somewhere because if it's just lying around camp, it's going to bring in animals, right? And um, you might not live somewhere where there are bears, uh, but there's mice everywhere. And if you want your food to remain intact and edible for your entire trip, um, food storage is super important. And so, uh, I'm not sure if Carol's going to cover this, but, um, you want to make sure that your where you store your food is away from your camp, um, you know. And you can go onto the LNT website, and they'll dive more into that. Um, they call it the bear triangle. Um, so separating your camp and your cooking area and your food storage area by certain distances. But um, when you're thinking about food storage, you want to 
figure out what the regulations are in the area, right? Some places require you to have a bear canister, other places don't. Um, and then think about your group size, how much food do you need to store? Um, and then does it need to be bear proof, right? So some different options for bear proof, there's bear canisters, uh, which are a hard sided canister um, that come in a couple different sizes. And then there are bear bags. Um, these are somewhat controversial. Um, I don't know a whole lot about them. I've never used them, but talk to people that have and do some research if you decide to use those ones. Um, but they're like a Kevlar bag that ties up, I think. Um, and you have to tie it a certain way to make sure that the bears don't get into it. Um, and then bear hangs are another option. And that's basically um, throwing a rope over a tree limb like you see in the diagram and hoisting your food up. Um, and I believe that needs to be I'm going to blank on the, um, on the height. It needs to be six feet out from the trunk. And I think it's eight or 10 oh. feet up from the ground. 12, feet. 12, 12, 12 feet, feet is safe. Safe. Okay. Maybe 10 will work with 12. Assists. Yeah. Over there in grizzly country. Um, <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, if you are going to use a bear hang, you also need to think about, you know, does the area that I'm going backpacking in have uh, the potential to have good trees for me to hang a bear hang off of. Um, you know, if it's a pine forest, you're probably not going to find a good bear hang tree. And so at that point, a canister is going to be a better option. Uh, and then, you know, some parks and front country sites have bear boxes at different campsites. And those are great because you can, you don't, need to have a canister or anything you can just put all your food in that bear box it'll latch and you're good to go but don't expect that to be there um bring a system with you either a canister or a bear hang and make sure that you hang your food and your smellables which are anything that has a scent to it um every night and during the day so um and then Hydration. This is so important when you're backpacking and you need to make sure that you have enough um, storage capacity. So a trail crew member should be able to hold at a minimum three to four liters of water in their pack at any given time. Um, you know, if you're working in an area that ha has abundant amounts of water, um, you might be able to get away with a little bit less um, but it's better to be safe than sorry. And, um, I carry a bladder and then usually one or two Nalgene's. Um, so close to four to five liters of water, um, depending on, you know, the length of the hike and that sort of stuff. But, um, yeah, just make sure that you have enough, um, storage capacity and, you'll also likely need to filter or treat your water. And so you'll want to figure out a system that works for you. Uh, there are hand pumps that filter your water for you. There's gravity filters. Um, so those are like bags that you fill with water and you hang them in a tree and they have a filter in them. And, you know, as gravity does what it does, it, that water filters through and usually goes into a water bottle or a water storage um, canister, you know, like a QB or something. Uh, and then there's also drops like Aquamira um, that can be used to treat your water and iodine tablets. Um, I personally carry Aquamira. Um, I, that's, just my preference, but any of these work. Um, and, you know, do your research on the Aquamira and the iodine. You know, if you don't want to put 
things into your water, um, then a hand pump or a gravity filter might be a good option for you. And then hygiene. Hygiene is going to be so important um, in the backcountry. You know, one to keep yourself healthy um, and your crewmates or backpacking buddies healthy, um, but also it just makes you so much more comfortable out there, you know, if you're out there for an extended period of time. So a couple things to consider when you are choosing what um, hygiene items to bring with you. Um, think about l &T principles, right? Um, you don't want to be bringing a whole lot of chemicals into the ecosystem. Um, and so biodegradable soaps, um, if you are gonna use soap or bleach, not dumping, the soap or bleach into water systems. Instead, you can dig a sump hole um, 200 feet from any water and basically pour um, that water that maybe has some soap or some bleach into that sump hole so that it has some time to filter um, through the soil. Uh, and then travel size toiletries are great. You know, you don't need to bring a whole um, bottle of soap, you know, just go to the store and grab a little small one or like REI sells um, reusable ones that are usually like Nalgene brand. And those, you know, you can use whatever products you have at home um, and fill those up, but you don't have to carry um, as big of containers. And then this thought of smellables. So anything that has a scent, so that's a lot of like hygiene type things, right? Deodorant, toothpaste, lip balm, sunscreen. Um, those also have to fit in whatever food storage system you've decided to use. And so uh, just make sure that <clears throat> as you're packing, your smellables also fit with your food and you aren't overflowing whatever food storage system you have. Um, you also want to carry a first aid kit. If you're in a group, you know, it may be that one person is carrying a first aid kit for everybody in the group. Um, but if you're by yourself, you should still carry one. Um, a lot of the med kits that are for sale, uh, are rated by like the number of participants and some of them are rated by the type of work that um, they're meant for. And so, you know, keep an eye on how many people you're taking into the backcountry and make sure that you have a med kit that is, you know, the right size for that many people. Um, and then, you know, if, you are on a crosscut saw crew in the back country. Um, you are gonna need to carry a, I think a logging first aid kit that has quick clot in it and um, a few other like bleeding type things to, or to stop bleeding. So do some research on that, um, but make sure you've got a med kit. There's some, great options online and you know in store to buy you know ones that are pre-made but you can also put together your own med kit and um these med kits especially the mountain series ones i think on the back they have a list of everything that they have in them so you could probably take a peek at someone else's take a picture of it and then go shopping and buy that stuff um, and build your own um and then to hold all that other stuff, we need a backpack, right? And so um, with a backpack, you wanna make sure that you're finding the right fit. I am not an expert at this. And so if you are looking for a backpack, I recommend you go into an outdoor store and have somebody working there measure you and get you fit for a backpack that is meant for your body type. Um, and that includes like the length of your torso um, and then also your hips because you've got your hip belt and then you want to make sure that uh, the 
backpack isn't pulling if it's too short it'll pull down on your shoulders um and if it's too tall you're not going to get a good weight distribution so um go to your local outdoor store and have them measure you for a pack um and then it's good to have a rain cover um or line your backpack with a garbage bag um or both um but it'll it's really terrible to show up to camp and have all your gear soaked and then you're out there for eight more days so it's a it's a small investment and but it's worth it um and like a contractor bag you know those heavy duty black plastic bags those are super cheap and they work great i like before i pack my bag i will put one of those in there to line my entire backpack and then all of my gear goes inside of that and then at the top i just kind of close it up and at that point i know if it rains the whole day like the outside of my backpack is going to be soaked but the rest of my stuff is going to be dry as bone so um yeah and then I included a couple little budget backpacking hacks that I've come across. Um, I'd love to see more in the chat if folks have other things. Um, I really love pocket ponchos, um, you know, just those plastic ones you can get at the gas station. It's great, like, to, especially when you're actually hiking to throw that on it can cover your pack and it covers you while you're hiking but you've got more breathability than your rain jacket still bring a rain jacket but you know it's a nice option um and can function as a pack cover if you don't have one of those um an emergency blanket that's a great thing to have either way but you know i i remember not having enough money to get a new sleeping bag and it was super cold out and you can wrap your sleeping bag with an emergency blanket and that's going to hold in more heat um and so you know if you are on a tight budget you know or you aren't quite sure if you're going to be warm enough that's just a great little extra to have in your pack that um will help you out maybe. Um, and then that contractor garbage bag uh, for lining your pack is a great option as well. Um, Katie, a couple questions, couple questions yeah. I wanna throw in here um, so we don't miss them before we move on to um, nutrition here in a minute. Uh, for over, for I'll have a little week, more. Uh, yeah, no, you got a little more time, you're, okay. you're fine. No, but for an overnight weekend trip, what size pack do, do you recommend? Uh, so obviously not an expedition size pack, what? 45 yeah. liter, I mean. I'm, I mean, that's gonna depend on the season and everything, right? Depending on how much gear you need to bring. But if it's if it's a summer backpacking trip um, for a weekend, I would think that you could probably get away with like a 40 or 50 liter. I My only backpack is an 85 liter because I used it for work. Um, and so I take that on my weekend backpacking trips, but I just don't fill it, right? So pretty much all backpacks have a lot of straps on them and you can just tighten those down. And if you have a really big backpack, just cause you're going for the weekend doesn't mean that you can't use that one. Um, but I would assume maybe other folks can put that in the chat too, um, 45 to 50 liters for a weekend. Um, but it also depends on your gear, right? If you're a lightweight fanatic, you might be able to get away with like a 25 liter backpack. Um, but if you don't have all lightweight gear, you're probably gonna need a larger pack. Yeah, good stuff. Thanks. And then, and do rain covers fit only the pack uh, or is it the room in case there's items hanging on the outside? Say that again, Bill, sorry. The, the rain cover uh, that you recommend, um, just a question about whether there's a uh, room under that cover for things that are hanging on the outside of the pack. They tend to be fit to the size of the pack. And so not gonna work if you've got your, uh, you know, a tool strapped to the outside of your pack, but if you've got maybe a thing or two, it'll work. Yeah, yeah, the, um, the packs are usually meant for 
or the pack covers are meant just to cover the pack. Um, but, you know, you can kind of, like if you have axes or some sort of tool on either side of your pack, you can usually, you know, put the pack co cover over the top and the bottom and the sides might be a little exposed, but because of those tools, um, yeah, it'll take a little finagling. Yeah, I'm gonna leave you alone with questions because we do gotta get to nutrition here. Yeah, okay, I'll speed this up a little, sorry. Um, it's just so exciting going backpacking. Um, packing your pack, this is super important. Um, you know, we have all this gear, but then we need to get it into the backpack and we need to get it into the backpack in a way that is gonna make it the most comfortable for you um, and limit injuries, right? So if you look at this diagram, um, we've got the heaviest items in red and then the lightest in green. The heaviest is closest to the center back of the backpacker. And then the lightest stuff is on the top outside. And then, you know, from there, it's kind of a range. Um, so for me, that red zone is usually my food um, and maybe my bladder for my water, right? Because most backpacks have a space for a bladder um, on the back. So food's usually gonna be your heaviest, one of your heaviest items. So I'll put that bear canister kind of right at the center of my back. And then from there, um, well, I'll usually, let me start over. I start, bottom of the yellow is gonna be my sleeping bag. And then I put the food in and then around the food where that orange is, I put my tent, my clothes, um, my stove. And then where that green is, is maybe like my rain jacket, any lighter items. Um, and then, you know, you've got your water bottles. Most backpacks have water bottle holders. And then the top of the pack, also known as the brain, so that top zippered section that's green, that is usually where you hold the things that you're gonna need to access during your hike. So that is your map, your snacks, your rain jacket, um, your med kit, your EpiPen, um, yeah, whatever else. Um, and then you also just want to think about, you know, what gear can't get damaged while you're backpacking. So your sleeping pad, if you put that on the outside, if you have an inflatable sleeping pad and you put that on the outside of your pack and you walk through a rose bush or something, there's the potential you could get a puncture, right? So you wanna put that on the inside of your pack so that it's protected. So just kind of thinking through those things. Um, and then once you have your pack packed, you want to put it on, right? And but it's meant to be adjusted to fit your body. So you're going to loosen all the straps, which is number one. Number two, you're going to do the hip belt first. So you're going to clip the hip belt and tighten it to where you want it to sit on your hips, um, whatever's comfortable for you, right? And then three, at that point, you're going to tighten down the shoulder straps um, to a comfortable tightness. And then four, um, you just want to make sure that you've got a little bit of space um, between your shoulder blades and the back of the pack um, so that it's not pulling down on your shoulders. And then five, you're going to um, clip that chest clip, which is going to kind of pull those shoulder um, shoulder straps off of like pulling your shoulders back. And then there's two straps kind of above, um, your traps that basically when they're adjusted, they either pull the weight forward or push the weight back. Um, and that will shift the weight from your hips to your shoulders. Uh, so, you know, if throughout your hike, 
different points, you might be like, oh, there's too much weight on my hips right now. And you might bring that pack uh, forward to put a little more weight on your shoulders or vice versa. And then I'll leave this up for a minute, but this is kind of just an overall packing list of things that you may want to bring into the backcountry. Um, so sleeping system, we've got a sleeping bag, a tent, sleeping pad, pillow, and a headlamp. Hydration system, we've got water bottle, bladder, treatment, or filters. Um, food system, bear canister, or bear hang, and then the food. Um, and then the kitchen system, stove and fuel, pots and pans, utensils, knife, plate, bowl, Tupperware, mug, tarp, lighter. Um, the hygiene system is the longest, but you know, definitely pare it down for whatever your needs are. Um, bring a trowel or a wag bag. Um, if you're on a trail crew and you have a bunch of digging tools and you have an extra one, you could use you know, a Pulaski or something. Um, and then toilet paper, baby wipes, hand soap, dish soap, bleach, hand sanitizer, feminine products, um, toothbrush, toothpaste, deodorant, sunscreen. Make sure you bring your medications and enough medication for you to be in the back country for however long you're gonna be out there. Um, being in the back country is not the time to stop taking your medications. Um, please don't do that. Uh, yeah. Another note, baby wipes are probably the best thing for the backcountry. You know, you can take a backpacker shower with them, um, clean your face, you know, wipe your hands off at the end of the day. Yeah. They're just really nice to have because you aren't going to get a shower, um, usually. So yeah. And then, um, clothing system, this is gonna depend on how long you're out for, right? But um, pull these different items um, and you'll have to adjust the number of items that you need. But just remember that like when you're in the back country for, for five days, you don't need five pairs of pants. You know, I'd probably take one pair of work pants and one pair of camp pants um, for that amount of time. Um, you know, you're, you're going to end up smelling, you're going to be sweaty, but, and you want to be comfortable, but you aren't going to be able to bring everything you've ever dreamed of into the back country. Um, so yeah. Um, maybe I'll have Bill send out my email. I'm happy to answer any questions about this. Um, but I hope folks, I, this is a lot of information, but you know, you can it go spurred, to good it spurred a lot of great conversation. It has spurred a lot of great conversation in the chat. And I know as a presenter, you you can't necessarily see the chat, but this is this has been like an incredibly robust um, learning opportunity because people were learning from each other and learning from your presentation. Cool. Um, yeah, and if you're okay, I'll put your uh, I can put your email in the chat if you want me to do that. But I'll um, but yeah, and I hate to move along here, but I want to give Carol enough time to tackle the nutrition piece of this. Um, it's okay. The, 22 minutes or so that we have left but Katie thank you so much and if you'll stop screen share we'll let yep. uh, Carol hop in here and uh, walk through our friend Jesse Satterfield's presentation on nutrition great so backcountry nutrition basically how to have fun with food in the backcountry so what's on your plate do you carry just one plate so that you can put everything in it and what happens if you run out of food do you ever have a protein shortage do you ever think about eating things that maybe weren't in your pack um, don't want to run out of food. So let's talk about how to do that. He's craving some extra vegetable protein right here and he's thinking about food. So this is a photo that Jesse put in there. I can guarantee you that nothing in her plate ever looked like that. But basically she guaranteed that, you know, what's on there is probably burnt on the bottom and tastes like bad coffee and you don't want your food to turn out like that. So backcountry nutrition is really important. It's important for two reasons. You need energy and you need fun. For energy, it's the content in food that's responsible for muscle recovery, really important. And vitamins and mineral content in food mitigates future illness. You don't wanna get sick out there. Food is also really fun. It's the variety and the spice of life, especially when your crew 
or you become pretty monotonous in the backcountry. So you need to properly plan your meals because that's something everyone can look forward to, right? I'm gonna hurry a little bit here. Katie covered hydration, but again, before you even think about food, it's the most important nutrient you can consume in the trail. Um, so I want you to go ahead and use your chat and put in there what percentage of the human body you think is composed of water. Then we'll get to the answer. Just go ahead and put it in the chat. Water is the star of the meal planning. Water plans our body. It cleanses our body of toxins and keeps us sweating during long work days, which is important. You need to plan to have the right amount of water in the right places and stored safely in your pack or in your body, not leaked out all over your food, right? Working folks in the backcountry need about four liters of water a day, 12 ounces of water every 12 minutes during the workday. Bottles tend to be bulky, but are convenient for storing small amounts. Um, Jesse recommends a hydration bladder as Katie did with a hose attached to your back strap so you can hydrate frequently. You can also carry more water that way and it's less likely to take up awkward space in your pack. Did you know that thirst is an early sign of hydration? By the time the thirst response is activated, you're already two to 3% dehydrated, which can diminish high intensity endurance by almost 10%. So start your hike hydrated. Drink 14 to 22 ounces of water about two hours before you start your exercise, maybe during your morning breakfast. Drink 12 ounces of water every 20 minutes through the day. And when you return to camp, drink another 20 ounces of water every hour until you go to bed. Be sure to retain enough water for cooking, and be able to obtain more water using filtration systems that Katie talked about, because water is really important for a lot of things, including washing your hands and in your camp kitchen, and you've got to clean up before you cook. Hello, am I still there? Yep, we can hear you, Carol. I can't switch my slide. On the Let's bottom go. left, maybe? No, hang on a minute. I'm having power troubles at home. I apologize. Hang on just a moment, please. Um, there we go. So factors that affect meal planning. First, is it just you or is it your group? If you're hiking in a group, you may still want to pack some or all of your individual meals. And what kind of weather are you going to have? Different weather, environmental conditions, merit greater caloric or water intake. So you got to be prepared. And durability, how long does the food last that you take? And what method are you being packed in on? Katie touched on this. You need to adjust your food packaging accordingly. How long is your trip? Day trips, multi-day trips, or extended spike camping? What activity level? The intensity and type and duration of activity level is greatly affects your caloric and macronutrient needs. And we're gonna talk about macronutrients. And what type of stove, availability of water, cooking implements, food storage will make up your kitchen setup? And what are your preferences? So what do you need to eat? eat? Everybody loves leftover pizza for breakfast, right? Though it may be tempting to bring lots of preferred high calorie food, it's important that your pack and food plans are manageable in the backcountry and that you're getting enough macronutrients to support your muscle recovery. So what does that mean? Well, macronutrients or macros as everybody calls them are the nutrients your body needs to provide calories or energy. Nutrients are what? you've got to have to do all your normal bodily functions. They're what your body needs in a large quantity. So there are three macronutrients, protein, carbs, and fat. And you can see how many calories per gram you usually get. So what are you thinking now? Do ultralight backpackers chug olive oil? Can you still eat your Cheetos? And maybe you're just gonna pack Cliff Bars to live on. Let's talk about all that. These are the portions of things you should look at as you're thinking about packing up. You want balanced meals and you want them for the trail. So you want three to five portions of your veggies, three to five portions of your fruit, one to three of your oils, two to three maybe of your dairy, one and a half to four and a half of like legumes, and then one to two portions of carbs. So this is good. All your food, all your macronutrients are in one plate, easy to do. So let's talk about protein. What do you need for protein? Well, for protein, men need a little bit more than women. And these are the protein groups. So paying attention to protein intake has a positive impact on how much you enjoy your journey down the trail. You need to avoid the adverse effects of protein deficiency on your performance and your comfort. The endurance needed on a backpacking trip exceeds your standard daily protein intake. 
So adult males need about 56 grams a day and females about 46. Um, there's a food and nutrition board link that I can put in the chat that recommends adults should get 10 to 35% of their calories from protein. So almost up to a third. So what are some protein tips? Add protein powder, hemp hearts, or chia seeds to your morning oatmeal. Eat protein-rich snacks like nuts, protein bars, and jerky for sustained energy. Pair your protein with a carb to make a complete protein. And for vegetarians and vegans, ensure that you're getting enough protein through supplementing if you need it. So let's take some spotlight looks at the macronutrients. So first, the fats. So some fat tips. Pack plenty of oil or butter to cook with and be generous with your oil portions. Look for rock hard green avocados for multi-day trips and try mixing avocado and tuna or salmon for a good protein snack. Use powdered yogurt instead of powdered milk for your granola and yogurt breakfast. Add some coconut flakes to breakfast or desserts and eat the larger flakes as a snack and eat a higher fat content during cold weather for energy efficiency. So the next macronutrient we wanna look at is the carbs. Carbs are essential for beginning to metabolize other slow burning fuels like protein and fat. There's no better trail carb than a tortilla. You can literally put all of the other foods we've discussed so far on a tortilla. Or if you're really hungry, you can just eat it. Other noteworthy trail carbs are sesame sticks, which also contain a pretty hefty serving of protein. Quinoa, again, added protein, plus it cooks really quickly. Bagels, because they're hard to squish and easy to eat, and potatoes. Did you know that if you don't have adequate carbs to metabolize, your body will actually break down your muscles for consumption? Bummer, not so good when you need muscles on the trail crew, right? So how about fruits and veggies? Well, they don't provide much macronutrient content, but they do provide essential vitamins and minerals. You don't need to factor your vegetables into your macro content, but you do need to include them in your planning. You can purchase dehydrated vegetables at specialty food stores or online, and choose fresh vegetables that don't bruise easily and keep for a long time unrefrigerated. You don't wanna end up with a tomato like that. So try things like carrots, cabbage, onions, garlic, broccoli, peppers, celery, apples and oranges, kale, radishes, and cauliflower. So here's some tips for your fresh produce. Buy them ripe and bruise free. They'll keep longer in your pack and give you more time. Spotty and blemished produce will go bad quicker after a little tossing around in your pack. Don't store your produce in sealed plastic bags. Ripening produces, releases gases in those bags and then they decompose. Use freeze dried or dehydrated pro produce, which can actually retain nearly the original levels of vitamins and minerals and weighs much less than ripe produce. Fruit and vegetable powders and multivitamins are great ultralight options for desperate vitamin and mineral needs. And plan your meals to include your most delicate produce in the early days and finish out your trip with those potatoes and onions. So what about the crew? If you're meal planning for a crew, it's important to discuss your food preferences before making a meal plan. For folks with food allergies or dietary restrictions, ingredients can be either excluded or separated before repackaging the food. If you're a group leader responsible for meal planning for a group, ask for help from the members with dietary restrictions to ensure that you are making some appropriate considerations for them. So now that we know what, how much? You can calculate calories, right? So this is a calorie calculator. You can see that extremely active, you need a lot more calories than you do for less active. And it's determined by your body weight. So let's look at an example. If you're 150 pounds and you're on a cut and run trail crew, consider very active, then you need 21 calories for that extremely active category you saw at the top times 150 pounds. That means 3,150 calories per day so that you can stay strong and work hard. So how do you calculate all that? How much, how much do you need and how do you know? The nutrition facts label on each item gives you some macronutrient breakdown as well as other vital information. That label can help you manually calculate this serving size and macro content. Alternatively, the Lose It app has a calculator for caloric intake as well as macronutrients. Jesse uses this for individual and group meal planning because it's easier to find nutritional information for bulk food purchases. So here's some planning tips really quick. Choose, and, and Katie mentioned this, when you get back to camp, the gourmet meals always sound good when you're packing them, but they're hard to make when you're tired. So choose quick cooking one pot meals 
avoid anything that's greasy, complicated, or requires frying because those foods make cleanup a lot harder and they can attract animals. Buy in bulk whenever you can. If your grocery store doesn't have a bulk section, check a natural food store or buy online. And there's a couple of examples there. Prep your food at home to speed cooking time. I do this a lot. For example, chop the first night's dinner veggies before you leave and pack them in a zip top bag. Save pack space and minimize the trash that you have to pack out by unwrapping all the store-bought sauces and mixes and consolidating them in one bag. Like that picture Katie had, take all that mac and cheese out of that box and just put it in Ziplocs. It makes a lot less bulk. Stay organized, cook faster by pre-measuring and pre-mixing your ingredients. Pack each meal's ingredients together in one zip top bag. It's easy to plan for just me, but planning for so many people might seem hard, but it's really not. To convert your food plan from you to a group, assess your group food preferences, multiply agreed upon individual food by the number of people in your group, and reconfigure your packaging, your disposal, and your kitchen needs. So let's talk about how to package for meals in the backcountry. Give me just a minute here to transition. Thank you for your patience. All right, let's repackage bulky items into a reusable plastic or silicone bag. We talked a little bit about that. Double bag any liquids or you don't wanna ruin everything in your pack. If planning for an individual, compile a day's food in a single large bag for ease of access. And somebody put that in the chat, like those two and three gallon zip tops, those are great for a whole day's food for a person. If planning for a group, compile like food items together and keep them separated by meal type, bags for breakfast, bags for lunch, bags for dinner and for snacks. Avoid or double bag sharp food items like uncooked, uncooked pasta, Label your unidentified food bags. This is really important. Salt and sugar look alike. You wouldn't want to pour sugar in with your pasta. So make sure you Sharpie the outside of that bag. Pack all food in a single food bag for easy access and easy camp storage. Store your food in an upright box or hang in a tree to prevent wildlife from accessing it. And Katie did a great job of covering that. Ensure that all of your food items fit into a bear-proof storage container if you're in bear country. And do not pack glass or cans, even if being packed in by ATV or stock. So let's take a look at some ways, that, and there's a really good um, link there I can put in the chat on the article about from backpacking foods. Reuse all your plastic bags if you can, especially with dry foods, you can do this. Buy bulk goods without the packaging and then package it at home with reusable bags. Purchase foods that come in sustainable packaging. And speaking of packaging, that's a wrap. So I think I ran through that fast enough, Bill, that we'll have time for a few questions, I hope. <laughs> you, were, you were highly efficient, Carol. You were highly <laughs> Good job, Carol. <laughs> I wanted to leave some time for a few questions. <laughs> yeah, so uh, questions, folks, if you uh, probably want to put them in the Q&A box. I'm afraid if we started having people uh, turn on mics and, and the cameras, we won't get time for as many. So uh, cool, there's already one in there. Katie, any advice for novice backpackers on feeling safe, especially as women spending time in the outdoors? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, well, I would say, especially if you're a novice, um, going backpacking with people that you trust uh, or on like an REI group trip or something like that, um, just to give you people to talk about, or not talk about, talk to about backpacking um, and kind of learn how to do it before you start trying to get out there on your own. Um, for myself, I still don't love going backpacking by myself, but I do it. Um, and when I do go, I usually pick places that I know the area. So I've done a day hike there before or um, have worked in the area before. And that way, you know, I kind of know what's around me. Um, I'm familiar with it. And it's also really nice to have a dog with you. If you can borrow a friend's dog or you have your own, um, that can be great. But, you know, I think it's also really good to start small, right? Do one night a mile from the car. And then that way 
you can build up from there. Um, my first time solo backpacking, I thought I was gonna, you know, backpack in like 15 miles and spend, you know, two nights out there. And the first, after the first night, I was like, I'm going back to the car. <laughs> so, um, yeah, just take it easy and yeah, you know, I think find I'm people that you like backpacking with and um, yeah, go, go with people you feel comfortable with. Sounds like really sound advice. Um, and those organized trips by, you mentioned REI or even some of the wilderness stewardship programs that are here in the NWSI have, you know, these are folks who are going out all the time and have volunteer trips where, you know, you're going with folks who are in the backcountry all the time and have learned a lot of tricks. Um, so great question. Um, Carol, for you, what was, what was the, how much of our body is made up of water? What's that percentage? And I just put it in the chat. It's 60%. 60% of your body is made up of water. There are a couple Q&A questions that have been in there. I think this one might be for Katie because she's probably done more than I have. What's your favorite backcountry meal? That's oh. a good question for everybody to answer in the chat. Too. <laughs> yeah, go ahead well, and put, it, put your favorite meal in the chat. Yeah, I like making Thanksgiving dinner. So I'll get dried stuffing and I'll take... Um, dried cranberries and canned chicken and put that in there and then make instant mashed potatoes. And uh, also there's like little packs of gravy. Um, and then I also really like tortellini. Dried tortellini is great because it's got some cheese in it. You throw some pesto, they have like dried pesto bags. Um, yeah. Tortellini is my favorite. Somebody's got cheesy grits and bacon bits in the chat. That sounds good to me too. Um, here's, a, here's one. Um, someone's into a dehydrating their own food, but they've heard if they don't do it quite right and leave a little bit of moisture, that that food could make you sick because they'll probably mold. Any advice on any from anybody that's done this? I'm going to put that out to participants because I haven't dehydrated my own food before. So if anybody's got any feedback on that. Um... So I Katie have, did, Katie I did have dehydrated my own food. A place to order some dehydrated food, which is Harmony House. Yeah. Uh, so, and you can buy a lot of that in bulk. That's really helpful for those of you who are putting together crew trips, um, uh, putting together an entire season and having that direct dehydrated food on the end. So. I have dehydrated my own food. If you use a food dehydrator and you really leave it on there as long as you can, it usually dries just fine, but it does take a long time and it takes a lot of prep. And like Bill was saying, some of the prepackaged dehydrated food now is very affordable is very well done. It's very high in micronutrients. It's good food. So I don't do so much of my own anymore. Um, any more questions? Oh, any tips on those of you that have packed a bear canister? Um, any tips on packing one? It says, I always end up having mine at the bottom of the pack. Yeah, I, um, I responded to that, I think, but maybe it didn't go to everybody. So I put my sleeping bag at the bottom of my backpack and then I put the bear canister on top of that vertical. And so that way it kind of goes from my mid back to my upper back and it's right up against my back because that's probably the heaviest thing that I have um, in my backpack. You could also put your sleeping pad on top of your sleeping bag if you need to give it a little more elevation to get it to the right spot on your back. Great answer. And so I just want to say thank you to Carol for kind of pitch hitting for, uh, for Jesse, who, whose uh, presentation she wasn't able to do in person. But Carol, you did a fantastic job. And Katie, thank you. such a great job. And, and to all of you folks uh, joining us, man, what rich discussion in the chat and what great questions.